Thanks very much, Rusty. We're blessed at the Kentucky Chamber to have a board of directors and other supporters who are the leading business people of this state, and it's an honor to work with them. Thanks to all of you for being at the summit. When I hear the content, like we had yesterday and this morning, number one, I think I need to go polish off my PowerPoint a little better because I've got to up my game. Uh, the content has been so great. And secondly, we need to do this in Kentucky. We need to have these conversations and bring in these experts and all. Ideas on tax reform and pension reform have been born at this summit in previous years. Uh, I, got a, I thought there was a brilliant idea this morning. Take Asian carp and Kentucky Proud and brand it, and we'll eat our way out of this problem. And immediately I thought, Next year's banquet could be really interesting. Uh, so if, if Kentucky Proud's game, we are. Uh, seriously, this, it's great for all of you to be here, and thanks for giving your time. We're on the home stretch now. In just a few minutes, we'll go to lunch, and at that time, we'll have Elizabeth McCoy interview Joe Kraft. I announced last night, I misstated, which I do frequently, but I misstated, I said he was the CEO of the year, and he thought he had won an award. I didn't have a plaque to present to him, but he's the featured CEO of the year. So at lunch, we'll get to know more about his fascinating career. Here's a guy that has done so well from Hazard, Kentucky, uh, and he's spending a lot of time in Ottawa, and he's the first chairman I've ever had when I get a text, and I call him back, and I say, what country are you in? Uh, but he travels back and forth, and he's been great as our chairman. Uh, recently made the front page of the New York Times. I thought that was an interesting article that he came out very well on, I thought. But uh, uh, we're great, great, grateful to have someone of his talent and expertise and leadership at the chamber. What I'd like to do is to kind of summarize where we at the Kentucky Chamber think some of the issues are. What's on our radar? And this is not just Dave thinking up some stuff. It's our policy councils, etc. So let me roll through a few things here. Uh, first, uh, uh, 30 seconds about the Kentucky Chamber, especially for those of you in leadership, Kentucky might not be familiar. Uh, this is our building in uh, Frankfort. We're right on I-64 between Louisville and Lexington. Uh, what is the Kentucky Chamber? We basically represent the interest of 68,000 employers across the state. So when we go before the House or the Senate or the Governor, we're speaking in their interest. And we represent big ones like UPS, Toyota, but also the small ones like the hardware store on Main Street. Uh, our board of directors I mentioned, there's our board a few months ago gathered in our lobby. And we have a staff, a professional staff there with subject matter experts in a lot of different areas. We have a team of five lobbyists that work at the Capitol. We have policy councils. They're kind of the heartbeat. They're, uh, they're not highly publicized, but those are business people from around the state who determine where we are going to be on a given issue, whether it's health care, taxation, education, uh, competitiveness, those sorts of things, and we encourage our chamber members to participate. They've been, those policy councils have been more robust in the last year or two under Ashley Watts and her uh, public affairs team than we've ever had before. Uh, 2016 to 2017, as we think about the environment in Frankfurt, clearly is shaped by the new political reality of Frankfurt. Whether you're of this party or that party or your leanings one way or the other, clearly elections make a difference. And in 2017, excuse me, 2015, we elected a Republican governor. We, elect, we already had a Republican Senate, Senate with President Robert Stivers. And we have now, for the first time in over 95 years, a Republican House. We had some drama last year regarding the leadership in the House, as you probably all witnessed uh, and read about. But David Osborne is the acting speaker. I was at his home the other night. I talked to his wife. They talked in terms of providing continuity. I think he will likely be the speaker when it's officially elected uh, going forward. Wonderful guy to work with, but this Republican majority means that some legislation things, frankly, that were bottled up for years, priorities of the business community, have seen the light of day and have been passed into the business environment that Terry Gill mentioned just a minute ago. And he can sell that now as we try to attract new people to this state. 2018 was a historic session. I won't go into great detail because it's now history, but pension reform was significant. Uh, tax reform. According to the nonpartisan 
National Tax Foundation, we moved from a ranking of 33rd up to 18th in terms of our tax climate being conducive to the growth of business and jobs. Uh, some people would say it wasn't enough. There are other things that we would like to see, but there was progress on tax reform. Workers' compensation, Ashley and her team worked for over a year to bring together the trial bar, labor unions, FOP, Fraternal Order of Police, the firefighters and others. We got all of them into agreement, except the Louisville FOP that weren't there to agree to anything. Uh, everybody else agreed, and we were able to get something through with bipartisan support in the legislature that will save every employer in the state money, but without disadvantaging workers. Essential employment skills, we've talked a little bit about that in previous session. We got that into the education system of our state. We've got to teach those skills like showing up on time, being drug free, and that sort of working in teams, communicating with your peers, etc. Medical review, uh, uh, medical peer review, that was important to hospitals. It relates to how doctors can talk to each other in confidence after a procedure at a hospital without the notes from that com conversation being used against them in court. Uh, we were one of two states that didn't have that protection for our medical providers. We now have it. Transpar uh, transparency in private uh, attorney contracting has to do with how an attorney general can choose law firms and pay them based on their commissions and all that. It caps how much a law firm can, can make by suing you with a calling card from the state government saying we're here on behalf of the state to sue you. It caps how much they can make from that. Uh, common sense reform, limited in the whole scheme of things, but we think very common sense. And visitor center tourism, this brings us back to Rusty and Kevin and our distiller friends and what, what options you have when you go to a visitor center and perhaps you want to do the taste test and then buy a bottle. Uh, uh, there was some cleanup that needed to be done and make it more progressive. Uh, there were a lot of issues facing the legislature. Here's Ashley, our uh, Vice President of Public Affairs, along with the bill sponsor, Adam Koenig from Northern Kentucky, and then the Coal Association and the Kentucky League of Cities testifying on workers' comp. That's what we do. That's our main reason to keep our doors open at the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce. Uh, here I was giving testimony on those essential employment skills at a hearing that was held at Toyota in Georgetown. We publish results for business. I think you got a copy at your place setting yesterday. Thumb through that. It gives the issues that we felt were victories, those that got left on the table, frankly, and need to be re-upped this next time. And also it gives the voting record of all legislators, your House members, and your senators. What's next in 2018? We've got another five months or so of 2018. What's next in 2018? A couple of things. Well, by the way, let me go back. That's probably the wrong picture. I'm showing a chamber of the legislature. It's probably the wrong one because, frankly, some things are going to be decided in court. And the Supreme Court now has that pension bill, and that what happens there, when it happens, is very important relative to elections, etc. Lawsuit over the pension bill really involves two things. It gets very technical. It gets over my head. probably gets over some of your head. But they're basically contesting the way it was passed in the last minute. Remember all the drama right at the end of the legislature? So that's being contested. And that's really what Franklin Circuit Court said, uh, you can't do that. That's unconstitutional to do something without the three readings and all that kind of thing. So it'll go to the Supreme Court. But the, also the merits of the bill in terms of what promises have we made to teachers. In other words, what's that inviolable contract that everybody talks about? The inviolable contract saying if you promise somebody on their first day of employment that they're going to get X, Y, and Z, you have an, an alter, unalterable, excuse me, unalterable obligation to pay that. And there's general agreement that some things are in that contract, some things, benefits that have been added later are outside, but perhaps the court will have to decide that. 2018, the governor's race. You say, no, wait, it's 2019. Eh, it's heated up already, uh, as we heard about yesterday. And so that affects things, and it will increasingly affect, thing, affect things going forward. On the Republican side, you've got Matt Bevan. We heard yesterday from one of our speakers that he will be running. You know, it's not official. We'll wait and see. The question is, who would be there if he didn't run on the Republican side? And I thought we had an excellent panel yesterday kind of speculating about that. On the Democratic side, one candidate is in, Andy Bashir, and his running mate was, is over there on the front row. Uh, 
Second, Rocky Atkins, generally expected. Uh, we were told yesterday, surely we'll be in the race. Uh, Allison London Grimes, well, I don't know, 50-50, according to yesterday's experts. Adam Edlin, 60-40 maybe. And then Attica Scott uh, has talked about it. We don't know. And who else is out there? It could be a very interesting Democratic primary. So 2019, certainly the politics and the issues will be shaped in 2019 as we go into that race. Um, we're going to publish a report later this year. We did it in 2015 called Four Pillars for Prosperity, and we did it intentionally to get those issues that we felt are most important for Kentucky into the dialogue of the governor's race. So we're now working with Ted Abernathy, you heard him yesterday, our consultant, and Diana Taylor to update that, and this fall we'll release a new version saying here are the issues we think need to be in, uh, debated in the governor's race. Uh, November elections are going to be very important. 90 House races out of 100 seats, uh, 18 Senate races out of 38 seats. So it's huge, and you heard yesterday about the teacher movement and all that. Big question, is there a blue wave? Uh, we heard some different numbers yesterday about whether or not the House would go back to Democratic. Uh, we'll have to see, but that's 2018, November 2018. Uh, will we have a special session? There's not a whole lot of talk about that, but depending on what happens back in the courtroom on pension reform, the governor has the option. He could call them in, I guess, tomorrow or Monday uh, to do whatever. They don't have to do it, but he can certainly call them in. So would there be a fix prescribed for pension reform if by chance the court rules some portion of it uh, didn't quite add up? Uh, there's a question, too, that is being debated right now about a tax fix. You know, they did, a, they did a major overhaul of the tax system in the last few hours of the legislature. And there are some technical fixes. I won't get into great detail. Combined reporting, our budget director here, John Chilton, can give you a seminar out in the lobby if you want on combined reporting. But it deals with companies that do business outside the state and whether or not they can voluntarily participate in combined reporting. My knowledge has probably overextended itself, Mr. Chilton, but <laughs> uh, but it's very important, and our team is on that, working with our members. Uh, a nonprofit fix, there were some unintended consequences for nonprofit groups, like if you go to the church carnival and pay a ticket to get in, uh, uh, technically, I guess there's a 6% tax on that. But So nonprofits are somewhat um, up in arms over that. It'll actually affect our chamber on a couple of things we do. So if at lunch, we'll probably pass around a plate to get your 6%. Uh, uh, let's see. So what will key issues be in 19? <clears throat> the governor's election, of course. January is the filing deadline, so we'll know who's in in January. May is, are the primaries, so we'll know the Republican choice, the Democratic choice. And then November, of course, is the big one uh, <clears throat> to elect a governor. There will be a session of the General Assembly, but it's the odd-numbered year, so it's the short session. <clears throat> Excuse me. In other words, a non-budget session. And that has some implications for what they take on, and if there's something that does require some revenue adjustment, it would take a supermajority in a special session. Uh, so there's some, uh, there some limitations on what you can do in a short session just from a practical standpoint. Here are some issues. Let me run through a few of things that we see out there. Education is an issue for all of us. And the pension uh, controversy this, this past year, or excuse me, in this last session, 18th session, got caught up in education very closely. The teachers' union banged that drum loudly and effectively. Uh, they stirred up a lot of emotion to where it kind of got to the point where you were either for education or you were for Matt Bevan, uh, which is a weird equation. Uh, our chamber, our top, our top policy priority is improving education in Kentucky. Uh, and yet, because we saw the need for pension reform in some form or fashion, and we were very specific in our recommendations to the administration about that, uh, uh, we were labeled by some as being anti-education, which I would say is a long way from the truth. But in terms of education, in terms of the uh, standing back from the controversy of 2018 and the November elections coming up, uh, certain things are happening. One is the progress 
we feel has started to plateau. After CARA was passed in 1990, some of you remember that, there was significant progress in Kentucky on education. There are some areas where we score very well in terms of how our students are doing in math and science and that sort of thing. But, and it was over a generation, for about a 20-year period, but that has started to plateau, even seeing some decline. There is still some positive information data out there, like we are in the top 10 in terms of our graduation rate now. But in other areas on scores and all, we have slipped a little bit, and that's worrisome. Uh, funding has been flat since the recession. I'll tell you why this statement is true and why it's also false. Uh, if you look back at funding, that that goes into the state formula and what hits the classroom in terms of textbooks and that sort of the basic cost that state government invests, it's been flat since the recession. I think anybody would agree with that. And that, in many ways, is unfortunate, but that's been the reality of the economy and our pension problem, which is, is dire. Uh, the reason this is not completely true, because if you look at it from another lens, education funding has increased substantially. How could that be? Well, I asked John Chilton, who is probably in the room here, one of our consultants, to look at the numbers, and from 2011 to 2017, a six-year span, he calculated that if you take the money that is put into educators' pensions, more money, Matt Bevin has put more money into pensions than any other governor by far to try to get us out of this ditch, that money, if you call it education spending, which we do, and the teachers' union says that too. Putting money into teachers' pension is putting money into education. Total spending has gone up 26%, according to our budget analyst. I ran this by the state folks over there in John Chilton's office. They came up with a different number. They said, nope, it's 27. Okay, I give. 27. 27% increase in education spending if you include educator spending. That's how deep a ditch we're in with the pension problem. And so, yeah, it's unfortunate that doesn't go into the pay stub of teachers or into classroom textbooks or lab equipment or summer school or teacher training. Unfortunately, all, some of that has been actually cut. Uh, but overall spending is up 27%. I think that tells a big story about kind of where we find ourselves in terms of trying to improve education. Uh, one change is the new Commissioner of Education. Those of you from Jefferson County have been reading daily about that and the potential takeover of the schools here and all that. Clearly, Wayne Lewis is taking a different approach, and that creates a new environment for education. I think the fundamental question for education is how do we make progress in education when money is limited, and for as far as we can see out in the future, a growing economy produces X number of dollars for state government. That's a great thing, but it will be absorbed by our ability to, or it will be dominated by our ability to pay the pension debt. That's the reality we face. So how uh, do we make progress in that kind of environment when no one, from our perspective would have said you could spend your way out of that problem, but it takes money to hire teachers. It takes money to buy textbooks. So that's a fundamental issue and a challenge that I think we're all going to have to be very creative in doing new things, new ways. Workforce, very related to education, in some ways synonymous. We're actively engaged in that. You heard some of that yesterday. Um, our workforce participation low, is low. What does that mean? Of the people who are a working age population, we have a low percentage. Some counties, it's extremely low. One calculation was that if we were simply at the national average in terms of workforce participation, today in Kentucky there would be another 130,000 people gainfully employed instead of, excuse the generalization, but sitting on a couch. Uh, that's huge. When we need all hands on deck, we need those folks, and so it's incarceration, it's addiction. Uh, there are several contributing factors. It's disability. Some of it is real disability, unfortunately, people disabled. Some of it, in my view, is fake disability, people who have managed to play the system to become disabled, uh, but they're somewhere on a golf course today. That sounds harsh. I'm sorry, but it's true. I mean, we got a phenomenon in the state of folks playing the system. And it's not just in the rural counties either. Employers need help. We're hearing that in, in spades from our members. Workforce is the issue. You've heard it several different ways in this session, I mean in this day and a half. 
Talent pipeline management, you've heard a little bit about that. That is the methodology that we are using to try to get businesses, for example, manufacturers in Hopkinsville together to plan their workforce future by assessing their needs, clearly communicating it to the high schools, the community college, other providers who might be out there, working with Fort Campbell, whatever they need to do to plan their future and to create a pipeline of talent into their shop, just like an auto manufacturer would plan the pipeline by which they get hubcaps at the right time to put onto a Camry and that sort of thing. It's taking supply chain methodology and using it with human resources. So workforce is huge, and related to workforce, of course, is what we've just heard about the, uh, from our uh, expert this morning, the opioid epidemic. Kentucky's at the epicenter. Uh, new prescription laws, the legislature has tried to act and to move to where your doctor has requirements now on how much they can give you, when they're going to see you the next time. Um, you know, there, there are new laws that uh, we hope will t bend the curve. Uh, federal money is cutting, coming. Senator McConnell has aggressively, aggressively pursued this. We've been in some sessions with him on that. And employers are becoming more engaged. That's important. We can't just say, okay, educators, send us some good people. Employers have got to be able to articulate their needs. <coughs> Excuse me. Tax reform, uh, I think it, getting back to the previous slide, uh, right now the big issue is the fix and what we will do on that. There is an ongoing study in the legislature about exemptions. Um, you know, it's easy to paint corporations as the bad guys that they're getting these exemptions. The big exemptions, you know who they go to? Us. When you donate to your church or the boys club or to your college, when you go to the grocery and don't have to pay sales tax on a loaf of bread and a quart of milk, um, those are exemptions that we benefit. Those are the big ones. Uh, and those are, uh, I mean, they need to take, our position has always been all those exemptions need to stand the light of day and need to be looked at periodically. New revenue is unlikely in 19 in part because it's a short session. And it's not a budget session, so it won't be the hot topic. Pension reform, we got to wait and see what the court says. Will a fix be necessary? Question mark. Monitor retirement systems. We're moving more into a monitor mode to watch the two retirement systems, their assumptions, their performance, the fees they pay, that sort of thing. And if you're a person of faith, I encourage you to pray for no market downturn. For the next three to five years, um, we need some breathing space to come out of the problem. And John, I think you were just appointed to the Kentucky Retirement System Board, weren't you? Congratulations. I know you have worked hard to, to achieve that honor. Uh, I'm glad you're there. Um, it's, it's, it's a tough haul. It's a tough haul. Uh, tort reform, let me spend just a minute on this. We're ranked 42nd in the U.S. What does that mean? That means in most other states, your business could operate in a manner in which you would have less chance of getting sued and perhaps put out of business. Let me tell three quick stories, and I'll dwell on this slide longer than a couple of the other ones. One is, uh, there was a judgment I read about in the Herald Leader. Over in eastern Kentucky, a jury awarded a $2 million judgment against a company, but added $60 million on top of that as punitive, a punitive judgment. In Kentucky, there is no limit on what a jury can award for non-economic damages, which really hurts our ranking and our business climate. So you can be sued and be put out of business in what some people call jackpot justice. Uh, they think, hey, that's a big company, that's a big hospital, it's a big nursing home, we can sue them, get $30 million for Aunt Susie, and, you know, everybody will be fine. Well, that creates a classic, I mean, a, 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 an environment which is horrible. So that your hospital, your nursing home, your doctor, uh, your, business, your business colleagues don't just have to worry about being sued, but they go into court, and because they can't afford the risk of a multi-million dollar judgment, they settle. And their insurance carrier or encourages them to settle. And so there's, I've talked to a hospital administrator. He said, we win when we go to court, but we can't afford to go to court because of the potential risk, so we settle. So it might cost $85,000, $100,000, $150,000 to settle so that you don't even get in the courtroom where somebody could smack you with several million dollars. That's a horrible environment. A lady who has a nursing home in western Kentucky told me the other day she just signed her insurance agreement for the next year. Her nursing home alone, an extra hundred, an extra hundred thousand dollars this next year. I don't know how many rooms she has, but if she has a hundred rooms, 
That's an extra thousand dollars per room that your Aunt Susie will pay, or your insurance. You know, it all comes back to us. The third example is my daughter is a midwife. She gives her career and her life to helping women have a positive birth experience and get healthy kids into this world. Well, she left her clinic, the, the women's clinic, because she was going to work on another degree, and she raising three kids. She wanted to nurse part-time elsewhere. And so she was faced with paying $40,000 to buy insurance for the tail. Do you know, I didn't even know what that was. The tail, that means that if a ba baby is born today, until that baby is 21 years old, they can sue the person who birthed that baby for some medical malpractice, alleged medical malpractice. So to buy the tail of your liability for a young woman building a family, she didn't have $40,000 check. That's the liability climate that medical professionals face every day in this state. So that's why we're so interested. This will be, tort reform will be a big issue for us going forward. Constitutional amendment, uh, it would take a constitutional amendment in Kentucky to put caps on jury awards. So not only would the legislature have to do it, it would have to go to the public and there'd be a ton of money put into that uh, with very emotional pleas that, oh, don't hurt Aunt Susie against these big corporations. Uh, it, it's going to take a multi-year educational effort, I think, to see how it's hurting Kentucky. Certificates of merit, that would be where lawyers and medical professionals work together to decide whether a lawsuit has the merit to take it into the courtroom. Infrastructure road fund fix is another one. I'll just have a few more here. Uh, that's a big issue. More people driving electric cars, more people driving hybrids, more people driving uh, higher efficient, more efficient cars. So the road fund is hurting. We don't have the ability just to keep up the infrastructure, and infrastructure is absolutely critical for businesses to do their job. Just think of UPS when the Sherman Minton Bridge, a few blocks away over here, closed down. How do you feed the world port when a major bridge from the Midwest is closed uh, for months? Uh, criminal justice reform, that's something where Democrats and Republicans typically can find agreement, and we're very interested in that because our prison population is too great. We came at this issue not from the social justice angle, where the people in the faith community and others have come from. We came at it from financial. It's expensive to put somebody in Eddyville, very expensive, and the taxpayers put that bill. So defelonizing some, some drug possession, more supervision and less car incarceration. Supervision is more productive for the person and also cheaper, and bail reform. Unemployment insurance needs to be revised. I won't go into great detail, but we need to compete with surrounding states. Uh, we have a 27-week benefit period here, and you might know personal stories of people who've waited until the end before they start looking for a job. Uh, where that is uh, excessive compared to other states. Uh, benefit period contingent, uh, there's some proposal, if the unemployment rate in a particular county is 14%, unemployment maybe needs to be a longer period. If it's 2.5%, it could be shorter period. So that's being talked about in Frankfurt. Net metering is a utility issue relating to whether or not uh, all customers need to subsidize solar customers. That will still be in play. Do you give subsidies? Um, uh, how do we keep our energy costs competitive, et cetera? There's some miscellaneous issues, uh, sports betting we've heard about in this session. A tribunal reform. If a principal or a school system attempts to dismiss a teacher for whatever reason, being tardy for work or whatever the offense is, they have to go before a tribunal and those things get clogged up. We want to see some tribunal reform. And then asbestos reform has to do with companies that are affected by that particular issue. So those are some of the miscellaneous issues. If all this sort of confuses or overwhelms you a little bit, it does us too. I want to show one more picture that I took from my phone in Frankfurt that kind of describes the world in which some of us live in Frankfurt, Kentucky. Uh, explain this slide to me. <laughs> this is in a parking garage in Frankfurt. I said, man, that says so much right there. <laughs> Where do you go? Where do you go? Uh, but anyhow, with that upbeat lift, I'll tell you, we can help you stay informed. We have the Bottom Line News Service. You met Jacqueline yesterday. We're the first chamber in the country, I'm proud of this, that formed a news bureau and hired a reporter to report business news for a, a Frankfurt news for a business audience. So keep up with, you can subscribe to that and get those. Um, and then, of course, we're on Twitter and Facebook and all that. 
But thank you all very much for paying attention. Uh, I enjoy being with you.